Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I think the NSCA, I thank you very much for bringing me out here. I think you put a sport like swimming at the four o'clock to 450 slot right before libations uh, for a reason. You guys kind of wanted me to get, to get this going. So without further ado, we're gonna talk about the general physical preparations that uh, are required for a swimmer. And so re regardless of, that's okay. There we go. So regardless of whether you're in this audience and you're going to be working with high school athletes, whether you're in a collegiate setting and you're working with collegiate settings, or let's say you run your own private facility and you have a kid that's either moving back to a geographical location that he grew up in, or is caught wind that you do some great things in general physical preparation and other sports demands, and they're looking to get you to take them to the next level, all these things are applicable if you number, number one, identify what the goal is. So if it's the people like are on the right of this picture, four people that are qualified for the Olympic Games and look to hopefully succeed in the Olympic Games, or it's a bunch of 18 and unders that are still just enjoying the sport, that want to continue swimming at the collegiate level and want to, and want to swim at a, at a high level, the goals remain the same as long as you know what they are. So this is the process. Okay, it starts seriously with the process. The, the, the picture on the right is taken right from Michael Phelps' 2000 Olympic preparation. So one of the things that I felt really, really blessed with when I came into the swimming world, I did not swim growing up. I had no experience with the sport of swimming. First job out of grad school at the best institution in the United States, the University of Michigan, hired me. But like most people, I wanted to, to get into the priority sports, baseball, football, basketball, hockey, whatever else. So I had to learn this sport very quickly. And I think it's important for all sports, but definitely for a sport that requires energy system first and then the general physical development second, you have to understand the coach's plan. And so walking in, this was 2004, so Michael had already been to two Olympic games, done some, some moderate success. To understand that his coach, he got periodization. So he'd been to Indigo Majikas, He'd been to Tudor Obampas, he understood periodization, so we spoke at least one similar, similar language. And the picture on the right, this was from 2000, right? We're now sitting in 2017 and people are talking about sleep. Sleep is so important, sleep monitoring. And then it's, you know, I'm not saying that it's not, and we're gonna to touch on it later on. Hydration, really, really important. Focus on goals. By the time I got to this guy, he was dialed in. He knew exactly what he needed to do to compete at the highest level. So sometimes when we start in, in our general physical preparation plans and our strength training plans, we talk about, oh, we gotta make them tough. What type of, let me go back. There we go. We're good. So at what point in time do I need to make this guy more mentally resilient? He's been to the highest level. He's won the highest medal count. Why do I have to have programs that make him tougher? Then the plan altered when he got to the college level. I think it's very appropriate that you guys brought us out here to Las Vegas, because I think this, this city is directly responsible for about three to six Olympic gold medals that we probably could have won. Here's Michael and Allison DJing and Nathan Adrian's joining them. I don't believe the young ladies that are surrounding them with his birthday cake were on the Olympic team. I just must have overlooked them. But as we all know, when they start to translate, your plan gets altered. The sport of swimming. The reason why I emphasize understanding whatever your coach and your athlete's program is, is you're going to understand that the new, the new kind of hot word, the minimal effective dose, it just becomes an effective dose with your general physical preparation. So this is Hans Seeley's general adaptation syndrome. We're all pretty familiar with it. There's a the minimal effective dose. There's functional overreaching. We have to live somewhere in the middle with that, especially with what we do, because they're going to train at least six times a week. They're going to train most of those six days of the week. At least three, two or three of them are going to be doubles each day. So in terms of neurological, metabolic fatigue, they're already there day one when they get to you in your work cycle. So I think you have to understand and appreciate this. The sword of swimming, like any of the other Olympic sports, you have to be worried about these guys, the gurus on the go. 
I think even in the revenue sports, the people that have everything figured out, the guys with like names like Dr. Feet, they kind of can figure out everything, but they don't really do anything in the general physical preparation mode. Because your athletes will hear that, and all of a sudden they become, they go from athlete to general population. Right? They want to do stuff that athletes don't do. They want to do stuff that general population do. And always keep in mind, these guys are athletes. You hear a common belief system that they can't do plyometrics, they can't do box jumps, they can't do multi-joint lifts because they're not athletes. Look at the timing and the synchronization of this event. Is that not multi-joint? Does that not require the highest amount of central nervous system mastery possible? This is the underwater from that 200 butterfly race that Bob Bowman was referring to earlier in his talk. So this is stroke and speed almost blind. Keep that in consideration because this, this, this goes for all levels of swimmers. If they can do this, then they can do just about anything that you want them to do in your weight room. It just comes back to you. Can you coach it and are you willing to take the time to coach it for them to master it? So we'll kind of go through a little bit health training history. I don't care what type of screening system you use, use it as a correlation, not as a causation. So if, they have a, if you're using an FMS and they have a one on a certain test, don't use that as a causation for you to never do a certain exercise or a modality or pigeonhole this athlete from their growth because they have that score. Again, coach it up and improve that movement strategy. Understand their training load. So if, they're, if you're in a college setting and the kid gets to you, you get your information from the medical team it's also important to get your information from the sport coach, the SPP coach that recruited them, so that it can give you a general understanding, have these kids ever done any sort of GPP work, weight room work, dry land work, whatever the term is, have they done that in their history? Because they're gonna kinda know where is their functional capacity? Where is their entry level? Where are they potentially maxed out? and refer out, if it's, refer out to a specialist if needed. This is for those that are working in maybe a, a personal training setting or in a high school setting. Whatever you do to onboard them to see if whether or not their bodies can get into the proper positions to absorb and adapt to the stress, if it looks funny to you, don't try and become someone in the medical field, refer them out. This is kind of just, if you want to hit play on this one. Coach Bowman was referring to our state-of-the-art facilities, our state-of-the-art tracking systems, and our state-of-the-art monitoring systems. The best part is, the best, the best part of the, working with swimmers is you've got so much time. We hear a lot about slow cooking or long-term athletic development. Understand that at whatever level they're at, if the coach or the athlete believes it's time to start onboarding you as a strength coach, as a personal trainer, they've already achieved some sort of level of, of skill mastery in the water. So they just think what you can add to them is maybe the extra one or two percent. Some coaches sometimes think that strength's gonna make up 50 percent and all of a sudden become Olympic gold medalist. I've yet to see that, but, but at any rate, take your time with them. These are all high school kids. You actually will see two ESPY award winners in here um, for disabled athletes. You probably didn't even recognize it in the first video because they're all the same, right? We talk about when they come in, we try and tailor individually. Really do it. If that's something that you hold your head on, that you individualize your programs, do it. So your needs analysis, your screening. The reasons why I think this is important in swimming is because you can see trends amongst training or program group. So if you're, again, if you're working in a, in a centralized facility, so you are a, you own your own personal gym and you have kids coming from different programs coming to you three times a week, four times a week. You can pick up trends from maybe two kids that come from this high school and two kids that come from this high school by just, a, by just using your eyes. I use this example because this is two Olympians coming from the same university, training the same group. Shoulders, you can see that there's something that's going on, the most important thing, their swimming program that's leading to these anatomical chains. And then you can see that your interventions and your trends amongst them. So if you're doing some soft tissue work, if you're doing some quote unquote mobility work into a hypermobile population, are you really intervening something that's becoming effective amongst an entire group? 
If you're, in an, if you're in an academic institution and you're using some monitoring systems, you can see the trends amongst the academic majors, lifestyle compensations, right? So if, you're, if the NC2A institution requires you to lift the athletes in the morning or the coaches require you to lift them in the morning, your onboarding system and knowing exactly what their major is may tell you why these athletes are, uh, for the whole, pretty bad at the very high CNS level activities. It's because they're engineers or they all go to Stanford and you're, you're, you're fighting a losing battle with morning practices. And again, is your training program, your weightlifting program or any sort of correctives or whatever you may call them, are you intervening or are you covering up for something that you don't want to take the time to change? You can tell this is a, this is a goofy population. Hypermobile, so when I hear mobility work for swimmers, I'm not so sure what we're immobilizing. Okay, think about some of these things when you're starting to intervene and starting to choose your exercise selection, your exercise modalities. Doesn't take a lot, you don't have to be a PT or an ATC or a physician to have someone just stand and hold their arms out their side like they normally would. Some sports specific screens, and again, can the body's, get, body's joints get into the position to absorb and adapt the stress? Okay, so if this is, a, this is a collegiate athlete that came into our clinic, he's already made it to the collegiate level. The coach tells me he's very good at all four strokes, the individual medley. This is why. He's got unbelievable glenohumeral joint ranges of motion. Whatever I do from that point forward, after every training block, whether you're on a three-week cycle, a six-week cycle, an eight-week cycle, you have no cycles, you just kind of throw stuff at the wall, you gotta go back and check this because they always have to have this position because that's what the coach recruited and that's what the coach wants at the bare minimum. Can rehab or corrective interventions return those joints to baseline sports-specific measurements? Okay, now if you've started to work with the program for multiple years, some of the things we started to look at is, do all the butterflyers, do all the backstrokers, freestyles and breaststroke, if you guys aren't swimming familiar, those are the four strokes. Do they all have baseline sports specific measurements? So I know at the bare minimum, that's the industry standard for swimming and for this particular stroke in swimming. So can, from my end of the world, from what I do, can I make sure that they always have that position or can I do things that can get them back into that position? So if a coach comes to me and says, hey, we recruited this kid because he's a fantastic backstroker, but we think he can be a really good breaststroker, you have some tools in your toolbox that you can refer back to and say, hey, for my end, coach, I've done everything I possibly can do, but for some reason I can't get their hip rotation to even be close to any of the breaststrokers we've ever had come through this institution and program. So I, I don't know, show me some education. What can we do? What kind of magic can we do? And does training shut the body down from a soft tissue standpoint or is it a motor control neurological standpoint? So meaning, when you put them through a certain exercise modality, whatever it may be because you're really good at coaching it, let's say it's an overhead snatch, but they're starting to fatigue towards the end of a week or towards the end of a cycle. Is it because they're so hypermobile that the neurological patterns cause them to shut down or are they so, are they so, in hypermobile in the glenohumeral joint that just to get that position, they're forcing their soft tissue through an already fatigued range of motion when you couple that with the swimming activities. Total body assessment for weight room intervention. This is a national team, top five in our country in a distance event. That's their plank after three seconds. I think that, that for the great thing is that kind of makes my job a little bit easier and knows in the direction of what we're going to do and things that they could potentially even consider in a weight room activity. It also tells you where, the ch where in the chain the weakness is. Again, is it, is it musculoskeletal weakness or is it joint fatigue somewhere else? Meaning you can see her shoulders are picking up a lot of the slack because of poor trunk stability, probably poor hip stability. So. We know that they have to use their shoulders irrespective of what, whether, what stroke they swim, so that's already getting fatigued. But we know that they don't even have the requisite trunk and hip stability, probably on down the line. So it helps map out where you put them in, into your program and what type of exercises and modalities you can give them. At the end of the day, we've, we've heard about the healthy team. This is from our Olympic team in swimming. For every modified training week, there's a 25% reduction in likelihood of success. 
However, seven times greater of reaching their performance goals when they complete at least 80% of their training. That's just from the USOC and from the 64 athletes that entered into our Elite Athlete Health Profile screen in the last quad. So whatever you can do on your end to make sure that they don't have to modify a pool training, this was pool training modifications, and at least keep them uh, completing 80%, you're standing a pretty darn good chance. Because if they do, if they're, if they'd reach this in the United States of America, they're winning medals. Okay, if they make it out of our trials and they make it out of our trials healthy, they will win a medal. Physical quality is necessary. I put this in here again to kind of emphasize the, the common mistake that they're not athletes and the common mistake that they don't re require a lot of the physical properties that we think about in other sports. Think of change of direction, deceleration that goes into this. Think, some, think of multi-joint movement. This is a very complex motor skill. And when I looked at this and I see this underwater, this is change of direction, this is acceleration, and the brain doesn't differentiate how you train that. So I think it, it pairs very nicely with understanding what the coach is doing in the water and some of the things that you may be able to do on land to increase the brain's ability to do these things at a high level. Physical qualities. You gotta look at the energy system qualities. So what you can do with an athlete, the physical qualities that they need. Energy system qualities. Again, when they get to you, start to talk to their coach. Did they come, if they're in a collegiate system, did they come from a high school program that was pretty high on volume, long aerobic swimming? If you know that, then you don't need to spend the first three weeks of your general physical preparation year your anatomical adaptation, having them run steps or stadiums. Unless that's what the coach dictates and mandates that you do, which if you've worked with swim coaches, they're quirky. They believe, you know, if they did that in 1988 and won a championship, we gotta do it now in 2017. But if they give you a blank slate, and you know that they, they are heavy on the aerobic volume, hit them with anaerobic stuff. Go for it. Technique. Weight room versus the pool. Again, your onboarding system. When you're thinking of your checklist or your buckets, whatever you want to talk about, things that you have to fill to improve the athlete's qualities, techniques. So do they have any sort of weight room background? If they do, reach out, call the person that they just came from, first and foremost, because if they're in your weight room and you're in a collegiate setting or post-grad setting, they're probably pretty darn good. And if they worked with somebody in the past, they'll give you some good insight. And then in the pool, again, talk to the coach. Is this a very technically sound swimmer? If the coach says no, but we recruited them because they have a big engine, they've got a lot of aerobic capacity, so we're gonna be spending a lot of time on their technique, think about that, how that parallels into your weight room activity in terms of their central nervous system ability, ability and res, re, reserve. Strength, all strength components matter in swimming. I don't care what you say, accelerative street, speed, strength, speed, speed strength, starting strength. All of them matter, all of them are important. And I would be willing to bet that most of them, once they get to you at the collegiate setting, none of these have really been focused on or improved upon. Hypertrophy, if possible, just goes back to your understanding of human uh, endocrine system. If they're doing a lot of high volume work, a lot of aerobic work in the male population, it's suppressing the ability to produce testosterone. So if you can do some hypertrophy work, go for it. Understand that your rep set and intensity scheme probably is not not really gonna affect their ability to, to go through hypertrophy work. Coordination, again, start talking to the coach. Is this a one stroke swimmer? Distance freestyler, can't do anything else? You're gonna probably have to do some low level coordination works, stuff that you would see 10 to 13 year olds do. You'll have them do it in the weight room and that's one of their main lifts or one of, one of their main activities. Coordination, again, talk to the swim coach. Is this a good swimmer or is this just someone that's really good at pulling? Are they a good swim kicker? If they are, a conversation ends, you don't need to know how good the kick is, you don't need to get any deeper, you know that they're coordinated because it's a bi bipedal movement. Stability, that goes, through, that goes through your onboarding assessment. If you're doing some of your planks or any of your other, if you're using FMS, whatever it may be, you'll know whether stability is a, is a quality that they have or if that's something that you have to work on and that all of a sudden becomes stability activities become your main lifts for them because you're trying to get them better for the long term. And power endurance, 
Uh, all swimmers, for the most part, except for those that have pretty much exhausted their, their collegiate eligibility, can all work on this domain. We're going to get to the Delancey rule right here. For those of you who don't know, this is Matt Delancey. He's the head of Olympic sports now at the University of Florida. I don't know of many coaches that are director of Olympic sports that have actually produced Olympians and Olympic medals more so than Matt Delancey. He works with their volleyball team, their track and field team, and their swimming team. He is by far the very, very best at being a coach that can coach the Olympic lifts for those that aren't competing in the Olympic weightlifting domain, if you get what I'm saying. He can coach the overhead snatch better than I've seen in a swimmer. So two Olympic events competing for, for one swimming. And this is his rule. They'll get stronger just from neural adaptation. Meaning, just give them a PVC part, he just brings them in, gives them a PVC or a training bar, and they'll do that for the first six weeks to the first semester when they're at the University of Florida. Become, make the basics savagely well. So all the different specialized exercises that go into the Olympic lifts, they become very, very good at those. And he always says that corrective exercises are just a fancy word for good coaching. Meaning the corrective exercises are just the same as the special exercises for the Olympic lifts or special exercises for powerlifting if you believe in West, uh, West Side Barbell. So you got to give credit where credit's due. Once I spent some time with him, I started understanding what he does, the ability to teach the Olympic lifts kind of took off. So what I wanted to go through is kind of give you guys a weekly cycle of what we did whether it was at the University of Michigan, North Baltimore Aquatic Club, and last year at Arizona State, so you can get a general understanding of what a week looks like when you're working with swimmers. So we have the, 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 the seven days of the week. We have whether or not they have a, an AM or PM water workout, and GPP is stuff that they would do with me, weight room activity. So on Monday morning, they come in, they do aerobic work. They use pins, paddles, fins, a pool boy, lots of low-level work. If you're a believer in the Charlie Francis system, I, I am a believer in the Charlie Francis system. I tried to mirror it for swimming, as, and you guys will kind of see it, it doesn't really work out that way with a sport like swimming, but it's a low CNS activity. Something, because this is, this is what we did, so understand what you do with your coach, your swim coach, you might be able to, to model that system, but just kind of giving you guys some, some ideas to do that. The PM water workout, threshold colors, but it's a low CNS activity. It's pretty hard in the cardiopulmonary system, but low in the central nervous system. We do no general physical preparation activities on Mondays. Tuesday, we come back again, Tuesday morning. We do active rest and it's stroke specific. It's moderate to high CNS activity. Why do I say moderate to high? If we're working on a stroke that they're not very technically proficient in it, high CNS activity. Active rest, it's interval training in swimming. So they're gonna be doing some high output speed work with active rest in between. So maybe just more on the moderate CNS activity. They don't do anything in, in, the, in the afternoon or evening, and that's where they come in the first weight room session with me. We're gonna get to it later on, but I follow Joe Ken's tier system, and I'll explain a little bit more, but that's our Big Squat Tuesday. So our tier one activity, big squats, a version of the squats. Our tier two is a reverse hyper, a hip thrust, something with a total body movement domain. And then our, our third activity is a, is a unilateral, bilateral, horizontal row. And a lot of that stuff, you know, it comes from the west side or a bodybuilding mentality, man. And, and you'll see kind of why we progress through and why I emphasize horizontal rows. Then we come back Wednesday morning, low aerobic, which if you understand aerobic work and aerobic, we're trying to reset the central nervous system. So again, it's paddles, fins, uh, buoy work, it's low central nervous system. And then Wednesday night is when we get after it. It's quality, race pace, speed, aerobic speed, high CNS. We don't typically do anything on Wednesdays, but there is some metabolic conditioning as deemed necessary by the coach athlete. Again, this comes back into the swimming culture. Maybe it's prevalent in other cultures, but they're quirky, where they think we got to do something, whether it's the athlete or coach. And I don't know what something means, so I had to have the coach, the athlete, define what it is. And I put metabolic work on there because oftentimes the coach says, hey, we just got to have the girls fit, which, again, it means that we gotta try and keep them skinny. I don't think that's, that's really necessary, but again, it's the coach's needs. Or, the, or what the women said is we really feel like the running activity made our legs stronger long course. So that's why we would use sleds, stadium stairs, and hill running. I knew that any athlete that worked with us had an aerobic capacity the size of the Atlantic Ocean. However, their tolerance to lactic work, especially on land, 
was a thimble. So those are, that's a physical quality that I can improve and it meets a kind of made up want by a coach or an athlete as well as something that I can hang my hat on as we're actually doing something affecting the athlete. Start back and you'll see Thursday kind of resets our week. So we have two kind of micro cycles in one week. Thursday they go back into threshold uh, color work in the morning and that's where we do that with more all four strokes of threshold work. We do nothing on Thursday afternoon and then it's the total body. Session total body usually is just any version of a, of a pull off the floor. Some swimmers, if, they, if I have never worked with them and they just got to me at the collegiate setting or they came to us when they were done with college in the postgraduate setting and they haven't been taught very well, the high grip hex bar deadlift may be their, their start and end game depending on where, how much time we had with them. Then we'll drop down, again it's a unilateral, unil, unilateral bilateral vertical row Again, following specialized exercises from Westside Barbell or bodybuilding exercises. And then it's a unilateral or bilateral frontal plane work on, on the legs. Friday is big kick, big kick Friday. That's moderate to high CNS activity. This is a very important thing in our weekly cycle to notice. That is a, by big kick Friday means that's, that's your running test sets. All the stuff that you do in the off season if you work with football players that you kind of do running activities. We do it every week in swimming with our kicking. So if I know that's something that Coach Bowman and his athletes value at the highest level, I have to protect their legs in some way so that the times that they get on the kicking are something that's relevant to them. That's why we chose Big, big Squat Tuesday being the first thing that we do during the week. Uh, PM work is quote unquote empower water work, um, but it's, it's go at your own pace or give Mr. Coach Bob a break where he would pretty much just put a workout on the wall and these guys would just kind of take a bath. So very, very, very low CNS activity. And again, on Friday, metabolic conditioning as necessary, deemed by the athlete and the coach. Saturday, again, it's the end of the week. End of the week, race pace speed, aerobic speed, the highest of high CNS, nothing on Saturday afternoon, and that's session U. Again, so the reason why I chose session, the upper body work on Saturday is because regardless of what they do, is in terms of their stroke, whether, regardless of what level they're at in swimming, they're always using their upper body, right? So the last thing I wanna do is put an emphasis on an, a lift or a modality at any point in time in the start of my week that I wanna measure or make sure that I'm improving in the weight room when it's gonna be compromised by what they're doing in the water or if I push them over the limit is going to compromise what they're doing in the water. So that's how I was able to fit the tier system into how we did it and why I think it's a very, very valuable system to use within the swimming population because it helps me strategically place what I want to get out of the weight room activity. Then we would hit kettlebell squats, dumbbell squats, rear foot elevated split squats, anything we can do to neurally reset the kind of lower extremities. And that's where we'll do some unilateral, bilateral posterior chain activities, maybe some med ball activities for a total body activity. All of Sunday is off. So the other thing I want you to take away from this, if you look at it, we're going all the time. So to try and understand, again, the minimal effective dose word that's getting thrown around, we're just trying to give them an effective dose because there is nothing minimal about swimming. The other thing I want to point out is that we always chose to do our GPP work, all weight room dry land work, as the last thing in the day. You know, it kind of gets back to what do we want them to be successful at? The 200 butterfly. What do, I, what do we want them to win a ton of medals in? The 400 IM. Whatever their stroke is going to be. I'm just a small supplement to it. So I got whatever was left of them for that day or at the end of the week. And that's why we structured our, our weight room activity. So keep that in the back of your mind as we kind of progress through this discussion. Why? Because of the dynamic warm up. Again, talk about people that impacted you as you're kind of developing my last kind of seasonal plan leading into Rio. Tim Palo works for the USOC. He's kind of the dynamic warm up man. This is his dynamic warm up show. And he talks about you know, strategies that go into a dynamic warm-up because a lot of people are saying, hey, if you've got this great dynamic warm-up, then your weight room programming will take care of it yourself, but you can't, co can't coach a back squat. So he, he kind of got me thinking, and he talked about, like, well, take a look at what you do for a dynamic warm-up and when you do it, and what are you getting out of it? So we had 12 exercises. We would do them six days a week, four times a, mo four times a month, 11 times a month. If they've been with me, like, on average five years, They've done that dynamic warm-up 15,840 times. Somewhere around 15,000 or before that, they're not really going to put much effort into that dynamic warm-up. And what are, we, what are we recovering from or what are we warming up from? 
And if you're weak, you can't potentiate, therefore you're inducing greater fatigue. So we tossed dynamic warm-ups out. Because by the time they got to me in the weight room, if they're not warmed up, then they've been a corpse, or for some reason, Bob Bowman can't co coach this particular person. So we tossed them out. Just something to consider if you're, if, you're spending, if you're getting 50 minutes to train an athlete and you're spending 15 of it doing something that they've already done in the water, hopefully, throw it out. So this is the tier system created by Joe Ken. It's a rotation of exercises based on priority. So I wanted to show you our weekly cycle first and foremost. Here's our priority system. Completion of training in the water, meeting the goals and expectations of the coach and the athlete. So that's the number one priority in our program. My program isn't separate from Coach Bowman and the swimming's program. We are one program working on one goal. Expectations and goals. Priority two, tier one exercises are strategically placed to get as much out of the swimming as well as the lift for that week. I went through why we stationed upper body, total body, and lower body work with emphasis. And priority three, tier four and five exercises narrowed down to needs of the athletes to improve general health and or special exercises to improve one of the big three lifts. So, uh, I'm an athletic trainer by trade as well as a certified strength coach. That's where our, if they needed some rehabilitative exercises or some prehabilitation exercises, that's our tier four and tier five. If they're clean, they're healthy, they've been with me for 14 years, like some of them, we're gonna do some, some specialized exercises that you would hear Dr. Yesis or Louis Simmons talk about to drive up the big lifts. Because by that time, they like to get under a bar and get after it. So just kind of some, so just some videos of maybe to kind of highlight what we do. On, on the right is Big Squat Tuesday. So that's a, a box squat. We didn't have a box at ASU, so bench with a plate on it. And video on the tier two. So this is something that we would do on Thursday. So it's a unilateral activity to strengthen, strengthen their squats, strengthen the activity starts and turns. So you still have the ability with these athletes, like I'm saying, to be able to get under a bar and get after it. So our total body activities. Again, when you think of the work that's going on and compounded throughout the week with swimmers, not a lot of intensity or can be thrown onto a bar of their total body activity. And if I'm trying to teach their technique, if they've got a history, that's Michael on the right, he's got a history of a low back, spondylolisthesis, we're gonna pull him through the box. Could he probably put more weight on the bar? Yeah. Is he moving it pretty fast? Is that not the intent of our triple extension exercises? Is that not the intent of the total body exercises? Is speed of movement, and he's confident in that? Cool, I'm good to go. He'll take care of the hard part, the swimming part. Now, if I try and get in his face and MF him, we're probably gonna get hurt, and he's not gonna buy into the program. And the video on the, on the right, the tier two exercises, like I said, it depends on what your repertoire is. Uh, do you mind hitting play on that far right exercise? Thank you, so we just grant the switch and just slow some low intensity, triple extension, med ball activity, we can increase the, med, the weight of that ball. And at the Olympic Training Center, that's at the Olympic Training Center, I can just use the track. Do you get it as high as that? Cool, we'll, we'll go up to the next height, next weight. So session U activities. Uh, so tier one, that's the top, is top priority. That's the only time during our program week that we do uh, vertical pulling. Why, because if you think of swimming, they're doing vertical pulling nonstop. But if I want to do something to measure it, that's when we'll do our weighted chin-ups, chin-ups chin -ups for endurance. And that's what we'll get the most out of that. So I know it's an easy way for them to dump. I have to protect their sh shoulders. So if he can go down and across once on that particular Saturday because it's been a tough week, cool, that's where we're at. He's getting what he thinks he can get out of it. And it's a tier three, so we're kind of killing two birds with one stone where he's in a side plank and he's just doing a horizontal row. So again, to emphasize, that's the way we broke up our, our upper body activity. I don't feel like we need to do a lot of pressing activities. If you look at most swimmers, their pecs are pretty well defined. Their anterior chest is pretty well defined. Not to do it, it just wasn't something that we put of high priority. But if they can't move strength to body mass ratio, they're dead in the water. 
And then Saturday considerations, like I said, what we try and do is doing some neuro reset, resetting patterns. So on the right, if you just mind hitting that one more time. Excuse me, on the left, yeah. So again, this gives me an opportunity to see, do we need to make some, some actions or some activities to reset her squat pattern while still externally loading it? You can get pretty heavy with some dumbbell. We've got up to females going 115 pound dumbbells on a front squat, so we can still externally load them, but we're grooving a facilitation of a pattern. And for posterior chain, pretty low level activity of the posterior chain, it's gonna facilitate the, the, the total body movements, and we can do this for mass, hypertrophy, endurance, correctives, wherever you wanna use it, but it's pretty low central nervous system activity. So that kind of gives you a little visualization of what it looks like on paper and some activity selections. I'll leave it to your disposal of what you can coach and what you can put on it. So peaking components. I don't like to use the word taper uh, in the swimming world. Taper is this fictitious place or location or, or bus stop that you either, I hit my taper or I missed my taper. Like I've, I've never seen the taper bus drive by. I've been to a lot of swim meets, a lot of swim practices. So we like to say peaking. And as always, swimming is the most important thing. So this is when you can kind of throw in your functional strength, your sports-specific strength, whatever you want to call it. But at this point in time, at any other point in time in your seasonal planning, the swimming is the most important. So are they hitting the times? Are they feeling the way they should feel in the water? And if they're not, you have to consider that very highly within what you're doing on the weight room activities. Stimulate, don't annihilate any other point in time, like this is go time. Okay, in the swimming world, you've just spent 10 months, three weeks preparing this organism to perform. If you disrupt it and annihilate it because you want to hit your velocity-based number or you want to hit some great squat number that you can put up there and say, I had a female swimmer do X, Y, Z of weight, you're missing the picture. Exercises and modalities that give them confidence. I'll preface this as saying this is people that have been through your program for multiple years, people that you have a relationship with from talking and interacting with, and they say, hey, I prefer this version of the squat, a buffalo bar squat, because it sounds cool. All right, we're going after it. That's what that athlete feels like. Again, as, as long as they are swimming, doing some movement activities, they will retain strength and appropriate speed and power for 21 to 24 days. So if you take all the weight room activities off, they're still doing, unlike most sports, when you peak, you stop doing everything in terms of physical activity. Swimming, you're still going. You're still being active. And then just make it athlete specific. I put this picture up here because this is the taper model that Michael used from age 16 until Rio. Pretty simple, basic. You can take a picture if you want. It's not, nothing great, but it's a pull up, it's a push up, it's a squat, it's a squat jump, and a bunch of cosmetic abs. Never changed it. I tried hard multiple times to change it. I was like, hey, he's 32 years old. Maybe we should change it up. Nope. Moving on. But with some athletes, we were able to kind of make adjustments. Again, some aquatic posture, so things that kind of make them feel good in a position that they're going to be in when they swim. Again, ab wheel, I put go at your own pace. So when they start to feel that connectivity from fingertips to toenails, they can stop. Uh, jump mats, the reason why we put jump mats in, if you look at you can kind of see their scores down there. Anybody that knows jump mats know that they, there's nothing special about them. But swimmers don't like to do anything hard during peaking season. But these are numbers, these are activities, these are competitions. Okay, we're gonna do the jump mat. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I put it on there. And that was for our sprint group and then one of our mid-distance distance swimmers you can see just kind of a little bit more we did use a little bit more uh, variation than what, that what Michael did, but it doesn't, it doesn't take much to continue to stimulate them through the, the peaking season. And here's another reason that it's really important to see what they're doing in the water. So I'm just throwing up a couple of Coach Bowman's actual workouts, July 6, 2016, uh, right after trials. Um, so you can kind of see they're doing parachute work just like you do on, on ground-based athletes. They're doing 625, so that's a, a short course pool. So very best swimmers going all out on the fast stuff. They're going to do that in about 11 to 13 seconds worth of work. So that's 11 to 13 seconds worth of resisted work eight times. Kind of makes up for any sort of lat pull downs or any sort of pulling activities that we need. Cords, super compensation, right? So you have to work on speed development. So that kind of gives you a little bit of, well, they're, they're kind of hitting some of the domains that I would normally hit in the weight room in the water. That's why I don't need to do as much. 
Another example, um, they're doing uh, pool boy and paddles at descending times of intensity. Okay, so they're overloading their joints and descending intensity. They're doing rockets where they go to the bottom of the pool and push off and try and vertical kick five times. They're kind of getting that explosive leg work that we think about during peaking season. Kind of helps structure exactly what you need to do. And I always like the, the little bottom hashtag uh, medals, hashtag Rio 2016. We try to stay hip with the generation. Like, that's what we're here for, man. We made the Olympic team. We're going to win medals. Uh, and this is one final workout. This is July 21st. So that's eight days before competition. So you can see our group, we're still getting after it. We're still doing work. They're diving 225s and one dive off, off the block for 50. So these are things that the athlete and the coach have a pretty good idea what time they should go. They've got to have high CNS activity. So those are some things that you just want to consider when you're going through a peaking season. If you understand what that is, the most important, it helps you map out your weight room activities completely. So some potential transfer when you get into some of these peaking activities or swimming activities. Go ahead and do my hit and play on that left one. That's a one-legged reverse hyper. Um, this athlete, Allison Schmidt, believed that her legs were her, her dynamite, her golden. She needed those to be successful. That's not too bad. I think it's about 325, one-legged reverse hyper. I hope Louie would be happy with that. Age considerations, so wear and, fati wear and fatigue on the shoulders during the peaking season. There's only so many push-ups that a 31-year-old body that's been swimming, uh, I don't know how much, they've, they've accumulated how many times around the globe he swam. Um, he's done the same thing for 15 years. There's some potential sport transfers. This was last year, I got real fancy and tried to use some of that velocity-based stuff, didn't, didn't work for us. He was gonna go off the blocks. There's a big difference between sitting in a weight room in Phoenix, Arizona, then on the starting blocks with the Japanese and the dirty Russians behind you. He's gonna push off a little bit harder, so we just kind of threw it out. It makes me feel like a goon sitting there. Overhead athletes that need to press. So if you're in a program where a coach or you, because you work for a head strength coach, it says you need to press. We have to bench press. Some considerations to kind of throw in. I love the sore necks bar. They call it the football bar. I asked them maybe, hey, you guys should change it to the, the, the medley bar. You know, there's four bars, there's four strokes in the medley. There's Chase Kaler, she, he's a silver medalist in the IM, didn't work. Or you can decrease intensity and stabilize. So if they've got some cuff damage, some labral damage, again, I stole this one from Louis Simmons and Westside Barbell. It's not exactly the intensity and the weight that those guys did, but the same, same intent that he has it for his guys with shoulder problems. Seemed to work pretty effectively for us. Core, with focused impact. So you can use your core activities. We all know what the chops, the lifts, and the payoff press do. But the way I use these is, number one on the right, central nervous system monitoring. So this is before we had the sleep monitoring systems and the sleep apps. If they can't maintain stability with that, boom, they're done. We're reducing what they're doing in the weight room activities. And with the payoff press, it's a protective exercise. If you, again, if you've worked with swimming and swimming coaches, they say at some point in time, two times a week, we gotta do ab work. What's ab work, coach? I don't know, but we gotta do ab work. Okay, and we know repeated forward flexion, repeated extensions, probably not good on the spine and the disc. Pal off press protects them and you're getting some activity that's actually beneficial. If you went through your needs analysis and you, f you realize that there's motor control deficiencies at other joints, train other joints using motor control. So if their hips and knees won't allow them to squat, Make sure you throw some stuff in their program that will allow them to train that neurological system so you can drive up the ability to do those big lifts that you want to do. Sports science. I kind of, kind of just wanted to throw some sports science stuff in here. Coach Bowman alluded to this, being able to do strokes and times a million times. So you see the set, 30-50s, kick, drill, swim on 130. The guy on the right, MP. That's his time. You can kind of see he did 16 strokes, except for the very last one, he did 13 strokes. There's his blood lactate levels after completion. Two rows over, you see Chase Kalish. He's kind of an upper coming fly. He sees where he needs to go if he's ever going to win a medal. Always start simple first if you're going to add monitoring systems, a simple wellness questionnaire. It addresses the biometric properties that the team values most. 
It limits the availability for subjective information. That's my only problem with questionnaires, especially with the collegiate aid population. It allows them to attack the coach's program or allows them to attack your program, right? Those that are flying high, swimming fast, they're fives across the board. Those that are spending a little bit too much time on Mill Avenue or State Street, if you've been to Michigan or, or Arizona State, you know those are the bar avenues. They're going to put threes and twos and the program stinks, right? So I try and keep a lot of subjective information out of it. Focus on questions that address the performance deficiencies. So what are you seeing in competition? What are you seeing in training? And how are you trying to get that information out of the athletes? And if you're in an academic institution, make sure you inc include sports psych and academics. Just a quick example of how we use this is from a WHOOP. If you guys are familiar with that sleep monitoring system, uh, this is a one, an, one athlete's 2016 um, weekly schedule. You'll see on the left, he was at a competition meet in Orlando, Florida. Then the, the USOC and USA Swimming so wisely flew an athlete all the way from Orlando, Florida to LA to do a USOC media summit. And any of you that have worked with athletes that have to do media and you've hooked them up to monitoring systems, you realize it shoots their HRV down, increases their resting heart rate because they got to be on point. Their smiles have to be smiling. They have to be Mr. or Mrs. Personality. Then they take them on a red eye flight back to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And you'll see where this, the value of using a monitoring system for this athlete, not only to give information to that athlete or coach of whether or not they're ready to go, instead of using yellow, red, and green, I kind of had to use maize and blue. Um, but basically, yellow still remains yellow, green, even though they hit that color up there, green still means go, and then blue is bad news. But it helps you give information to, if you're dealing with agents or you're dealing with USOC, USA Swimming, and say, hey, we've got to have Johnny Swimmer out to this media summer, this appearance. You can say, okay, if that's what you guys really want them, understand if you do this enough, the body will always respond that way, so you may not have this same person when it comes to Rio. So take that into consideration. Um, here we go with a, just a different, we used a sleep rate with Michael. And what we found, we did this for two years, this is optimal and a suboptimal sleeping pattern. So we knew that if we hit these metrics, it was go time. And anybody knows that if you followed swimming last year, finals didn't start till 9 p.m. So we already prepared him to get up and train and race and perform at 9 p.m. So we knew throughout the week, every day we woke up, Michael looks good to go. He didn't see these numbers, but we knew we'd practiced, we had trained it. Hey, as long as the bus gets him to the pool and he walks his ass behind the block, things are going to happen. They're going to be good. Uh, comparing impairment to sleep deprivation, I always like to put that in there. Think about that if you're in a collegiate setting, right? So those kids that are highly academic driven that don't get any hours of sleep, it's like consuming 10 to 11 beers. Those that don't really care about their academics, they're getting zero hours of sleep and they're drinking 11 to 12 beers, good luck with getting anything out of them. And then when you think about the optimal sleep circadian rhythm, take a picture of this and kind of assess it when it goes into what you can possibly do in the water and out of the water if you're using sleep monitor systems. Rise in blood pressure at 6.30 a.m. Like I told you, we did low level threshold work on Mondays and, and Thursday mornings. We finally had an answer as to why some kids were saying, hey, like, you're telling me to go at a certain 22 to 24 heart rate, but I'm 25 to 26. We thought they were lying for so many years. We, we just realized that we were training them right when there was a rise in blood pressure. Some sleep interventions, if you, just some quick, easy tips. Hot shower, uh, hot tub prior to sleep, consistent room temperature all the time. Open the window so you can get fresh air. Blackout curtains. Earplugs, tartary juice, no electronics. If you're going to use electronics, we use the Gunner sleep goggles. Kind of helped because, hey, you're winning medals. You got to tweet and do social media stuff. We used salivary cortisol for proper peaking models. This is when uh, we were coming out of our Colorado Springs altitude training camp. Um, May 20th was the start of our peaking season. If you kind of see the initials at the bottom, Everybody was pretty low except for MP and Allison Schmidt. We hedged our bets that we were working with them for long enough. We didn't need to start taking them down at altitude. We felt that they were good enough to have a minor peaking schedule and still make the team so that when we gave them a big peaking schedule, they'd be even faster at trials. Um, and the rest of them, we went, you know, we hit the lottery. We went uh, eight for eight in terms of lifetime best. We just, in the United States, so some of our other people didn't make the team. We had four. Uh, sports nutrition, always, I, I was in uh, Whole Foods 
in Denver, and I found this was pretty funny, right? Cookie bar, 50% off, right? So not everything at Whole Foods is perfect. Um, my colleague at the USOC, Dustin Nathan, always says that Whole Foods can't make up for a bad training program or insert whatever explicit you want a bad training program, but a great training program can make up for McDonald's diet. Use a qualified licensed uh, sports nutritionist if you're going to do that. Go back to your initial screen and what is the performance objective. Uh, just some quick things that you might want to put in to your, your kind of uh, memory bank. Body fat distributions among, amongst male and female Olympic 64 Olympic swimmers right there. There's your body fat distribution. That's what we looked like. So as you can see, there is no optimal body fat dis distri distribution for an Olympic male or Olympic female. And this is the great thing that we saw. There is no statistical significance between world rank high and low world rankings in body fat distribution. So it kind of limits your what we actually need in terms of body image. And just a simple co consideration, does it address a nutritional deficiency? Are they competing healthy? And if you're giving them a supplement, is it legal and safe? Don't chuck it. This was a picture of the Chinese towards the end of the, Be of the Rio games, right? They got McDonald's lined up. Their drugs didn't work. We caught them. Uh, some practical applications. So just some videos of some young kids. Um, you can see with these two guys, right? They were ready to go at an early age. They loved the sport of swimming. But here's a 14-year-old, a 14-year-old swimmer. At that age in our world, they're just a swimmer. They're not sprinters. They're not distance. They're not st strictly freestylers. They're not just the IMers. They're just swimmers. But he was hyperlordosis, he had Guillain-Barre syndrome, his biting score was four, positive valgus test, bilateral sulcus sign. Hey, at this age, keep it simple, stabilize the shoulders, take it slow. Some of our state-of-the-art training facilities again. Just some very, very simple, unloaded to very light-loaded activities. He mastered the fundamentals. He followed our block zero program, isometric holds for lower extremities push-ups, vertical pulls, teach some so low-level plyos, and that's our, uh, our fun activities. That was our sled work. We had to take a, an old 4x4 uh, four four piece of wood, put PVC pipes, and we dragged it up and down our breach to, to make it kind of fun. Same kid, now he's an adult. Can his body get in the positions to absorb and, absorb and adapt to the impending stresses? Swimming back, breaststroke is different than squatting. Swimming backstroke is different than deadlifting. So what are the considerations? What's most important? Did a little bit further medical evaluation. His hip socket is too valuable to do the IM, the breaststroke, than it is to squat. And he no longer even has 40 degrees of, of flexion at the ankle, so can he really even get in the position to squat or deadlift? He's got some minor disc degeneration now at this point in time, and he had some indication of spondylolisthesis. So now you make some, some modifications in your weight training program. You look on the left, I'm not cool with that deadlift position. Not the way his body, body rounds, not the way he's into complete cervical extension. Again, we go from the box. Spine looks a lot more stable. He's able to correct his head a little bit better. Gets bad at the end there. Still same intent. He's safe by my words. He'll still be able to go. Again, like I said, his hip socket's too valuable. Different, different person, but same intent. He's a breaststroker. Um, so the same activities. So we're still doing an, an externally loaded knee flexion activity, but now we get the opportunity for him to stabilize greater at the, at the, in the trunk, and we don't have to grind, and down, grind, grind down his hip. Favorable outcome, silver medal in the Rio Olympic Games, individual. 16-year-old, multi-event, from the 200 fly up to the 10K, unremarkable clinical exam, but a low bone mineral density because she's been doing long distance swimming since the age of 10. Exercise selection. Let's take a look at whether or not she can even do anything externally loaded. Look at her joint and motor control on this single leg squat. Shaking, she can't even get down there. We're, we're pretty good for our first couple weeks of training, first couple months of training, what this athlete needs. If you don't mind hitting that uh, video on the right. Planking and body position. So, that we, know, so we know that Thomas tests, so when they're on the table and you bring a knee to your chest, Thomas tests. A poor Thomas test has an increased risk of hamstring tears. So think of activities in the weight room that I probably want to avoid because in this plank position, look at her hip extension. She doesn't have any. Pretty easy to make some exercise selections off of this. 
She's got to learn core, core stabilization to even get close to the point of potentially doing something with on her back or pulling from the floor. Go ahead and hit the one on the right. Just in lieu of time, we're going to fly through these last ones. Pretty symmetrical side-by-side -side rotation. So we can probably start doing some med ball activities. Then we built up to this. And again, can she do this movement well? We'll work on speed. She's 16 years old. We'll work on speed down the line. And if, I, if you look back at her event selections, 200 fly to the 10K, speed will be taking care of itself. She'll be competing tomorrow, Saturday, for the US in the 10K events. So again, questions. I had to put this video in here. Right, the USOC, I love them but they tried to find a weight room for our athletes to train in after the Olympic trials, and they found one with this machine. It still exists. But the great thing is this young kid was like, I don't even know what this is, so at least it's out of most of them. But thank you for your time. I've gone over just a little bit. I know you're ready to get to the happy hour, but I'm open for any questions you guys may have.